Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. We're going to talk about the sixth trump and things that are associated with it and weave it together with the subjects that we have discussed earlier in uh, this weekend. And isn't Father's Word always so filling and it's so refreshing, especially when you find out how it applies to you and in what way it applies to you? That's so very important to know. I want to talk to you And as much as we know that there are six seals, there are six trumps, and there are six vials. That's 666. That's when Satan appears as the false messiah. And because that is soon coming, and I truly believe that, then I think we need to synchronize ourselves with the trumps and the seal so that we have a better understanding on what it is that you look for, for signs and seasons. So turn with me to the ninth chapter of Revelation. We're going to read about the sixth trump. Let's see what happens there and see if we can, in other words, this gives you a sign of what's happening during, at the very time, the instant that Satan appears on this earth as the false messiah. This is what triggers it. This is what the Father would have you know is the sixth trump. The fifth trump simply leads you to it. It's the teaching period. But the sixth trump is the action, the de facto appearance of the false messiah. That's important. So if we may, let's, um, let's read starting with the verse 13 concerning the sixth trump. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Now what what do horns symbolize? Power, God's power, God's in control. You don't have to sweat that. You don't have to worry about it. We've got it made, our Father's on the throne, and I got news for you, he's gonna stay there. He's, by that I mean in charge, with authority. Verse 14, listen carefully. Really think deep for me. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, blow that trumpet. Uh Uh-uh, that's not what he said. Loose the four angels which are bound. Underline the word bound and loose in your mind. In the great river Euphrates. Now the word Euphrates simply means the great and flowing river, but it has always been the boundary between God's people and Satan's domain. And it symbolizes that, spiritually speaking, as well. Okay? So they are bound within the very borders of good and bad. And you know, that's what makes it difficult for people oft times to make a decision on whether a party representing someone is good or bad because it always comes from that border right up to the line and they sneak, you know, like people that tell stories. And uh, (laughs) so there he is, okay. And uh, what was the order, blow the trumpet? No. Turn loose those fallen angels, the ones that are bound. Turn them loose. Turn them loose on who? Yes. You, if it's possible. This is going to happen, though, because you're familiar with it. This is why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that women should be on guard and have the veil. It's translated hair, but you've studied with me long enough to know. You know, because of what? Tenth verse. The angels. Not good angels. I mean bad, bad angels. Meaner than a jaybird whenever he's angry at something, okay? It's ornery, and worse than that, they're bad. 
So that was the first sign, okay? Let's go one more verse. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared. I do mean prepared, not maybe, perhaps. It's well planned. Prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. That means to deceive, make them spiritually dead in a hammer. They could be good Christians up to this point. But when they're loosed and appear in their with their leader, and you know who that is, the apostasy takes place because those that are not trained in God's word are gonna worship him. Many of your so-called churches, unfortunately, and that's sad, I, I really think it is, I could weep because of it, are gonna fall right in with them. Where does that leave you? All alone, no, on God's side. On God's side, not alone. With God, you're never alone. But you're right when you're with him. And don't ever forget that. Okay? They're going to be turned loose. That is the action of the sixth trump. And that time is set aside. When you put four days under one article in the sense of a preposition, it means an instant. God knows that instant. We don't. But we do know one thing. They are loosed at the beginning of the sixth trump. That is to say, even if anything, we could read into that, it's a little before it. Kind of sneaks up on us there if you're not careful, okay? And uh, what happens is it blends into the fifth trump, which is the time of teaching, which we're in right now. We're in the fifth trump. Make no mistake about that which is a time of teaching and testimony. That's what you're for, that's what you do, that's the role you play in God's plan. When you, it may be on an individual basis, it may be when someone is troubled, they ask you a question and you give them some sound advice from God's word. And it is the, the time of testimony. We'll document that before this lecture is over. But there is only one set that is bound that are supernatural. Turn with me to the book of Jude. Let's analyze this a little closer. Back to the book just before Revelation. They're loosed and they're bound, they're chained because of what? What they did in Noah's time. What they did in Noah's time, that's what. Jude, uh, Jude um, really, wanted to write a letter of compassion and he apologized for that. He said, no, I've got, to, I've got to get down where the rubber meets the road here. We got to talk about something that's very serious. So uh, in other words, he starts in verse three. Why don't we just read it? Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, the sweet stuff, and there's certainly salvation is sweet. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend, that is to say defend the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Don't you let some knucklehead come in and twist the truth. Don't you let someone rob people of the simplicity in which Christ taught. And I'll tell you one thing, we're in a generation that it certainly tried. There is more things flying around under the name of denominationalism and religion. And they never pick up a Bible. Never pick up, the, well, let's go by Brother Jones' book here on the everlasting sin. Well, it's, it's better to study about keeping away from sin rather than to study sin, you know, because, or stuff that gets you in sin. Brother Jones wasn't ordained by God to write a book in the Bible. So you better stick to God's book. And then you're reading the words of God, not man, okay? For there are certain men crept in unawares, verse four, who were before of old ordained, that means preordained, predestined, God's plan, playing part of that plan. To this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God, love that is, into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
What did they do? I will therefore put you in remembrance. I want you to remember this. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And there pops back in that 40 years in the wilderness. He said he saved them, but when they disobeyed him, he let them die. He didn't let them enter the promised land. And I'm going to tell you something. Many people that think they're heaven bound in this generation are in for a big shock when the millennium comes along. I'm not saying they're going to hell because we're going to try to prevent that. We're going to do a little educating in the hard way, tough love, discipline during that millennium period. So it is written in the book of Ezekiel. But that's better than losing them. But you know, talk about shame. And this is why it is written, they'll pray for the mountains to fall on them. You know, if you'd, let's say you'd headed a church, put your whole life into it, in a, in a system, and come to find out through the flyaway doctrine that you led your entire congregation to worship Satan. Would you want to face Jesus? I wouldn't. And that's why they'll pray for the, just, just wipe me out, take me away. I don't blame them, I would too. Why? You've got to stick with God's word or that's what happens to you. You begin to believe the traditions of men. Verse six, and the angels, these are the ones that are loosed. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, that is to say, they left heaven. He hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In other words, they'll get theirs on judgment day. Why? 7,000 of them kicked a bucket. When the uh, seventh trump sounds, they, don't have, they have no part in the millennium or any other period. They're done, finished, over. Because they left their place of habitation contrary to God's plan. These filthy angels saw the daughters of Adam, saw that they were beautiful, and came down and took them to wife. And from this uh, came the Geber, the giants, malefactors, misfits, not according to God's natural plan. And of course, what did they bring with them? It destroyed the whole concept of God having you born innocent of woman not remembering the first earth age, whereby you in peace could make your own mind up whether you would love God or Satan. These filthy things, having the knowledge and the wisdom to know all, know all the heavenly things, to know what happened before, and to know why God did it, and then trying to manipulate and mess up God's plan. Naturally, God put a stop to it, all right. He brought about the flood of Noah and killed off Satan's little attempt. But that's why these people, these Nephilim, were placed in chains. You can read of it in Genesis chapter 6 in detail. Some might say, well, are you sure it means that? Yes, it said they cohabited and children were born to them. Okay, that's pretty easy to understand, is it not? I think so. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, that means other, and set, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Don't mess with God's natural plan. It's dangerous. God doesn't like it, and um, it, it's going to cause nothing but trouble. Let's put it that way. Uh, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. They make light of Christianity today. <clears throat> it's getting to the point, if you allow it, that people will look down their nose and say, you're a Christian? I mean, you know what your answer is? You better believe it. And a good and to boot. What are you? We're the side that wins, okay? 
I don't believe in, in tolerating fools a whole lot, and I guess you notice that on television sometimes, don't you? Well, you know, old, old Marines and old military people are just not accustomed to that kind of stuff. So let's get it said the way it is, all right? So, that, so it's understood. Let's communicate. Now we're going to bring another party into the studies we've been making this weekend, nine. Yet Michael, remember the war in chapter 10 of, of Daniel? Lasted 31 years, didn't it? Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does uh, not bring against him a riling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee, Satan. Just like that. You don't argue with Satan. He'll pull you under if you give him a chance to. Just don't argue with him. But why did Satan dislike Michael so well? Michael's his jailer. Michael's the one that's got the key to the locks that's chaining up those loose and those fallen angels. Why did he want Moses' body? Moses was symbolic of law, God's commandments, and Satan hates them. He wants to instill his own set of laws. And you know something? A lot of people let him get away with it because they would rather go with Satan's law than they would God's common sense. It's true. It's like, let's take uh, the law, cocaine is of Satan. It'll mess up your mind. So naturally, he's going to push it where your mind is easily de dealt with. But cocaine, you start losing things. Other things become more important to you than your own family, your own job, your own obligation. And you'll end up losing everything you have. And people like it. They get sucked into it. They'll fall into a trap that they know is just waiting for them. Be intelligent, beloved, of all times in history. This is the time you stop, you think for yourself, and you kick dragon. When that kind of filth comes around, but I don't want to digress from our point. You got something a lot worse than this coming, and that's those angels, all right? Jesus himself would say in Matthew 24, What's it going to be like at the end? And he said, it's going to be just like it was in Noah's day. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage with those fallen angels again. Which ones? The ones loosed from the river Euphrates and turned loose on man again. With Satan leading them. Now some may say, well that sounds like a fairy tale. No, it happened. It's history. And it's written here. That's what Michael is talking about. Verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast in those things, they corrupt themselves. If it's, if, you know, if, if it's good, it's all right. Quite a philosophy, isn't it? Well, it's of the world. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. You know who Cain was? He was the first murderer, offspring of Satan and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. You got a lot of preachers, and all they want to do is preach for money. I'm sorry, I'm sad, it's sad to say, well, are you judging him? No, what a man teaches most is what he's got on his mind. I mean, is that difficult to figure? If, if all somebody talks about is chocolate cake, what do you think they have on their mind? Chocolate cake. If all somebody does is beg money, what do they got on their mind? Money, not God. The sad part is, friend, it's your money they're interested in. All right. We said, we were, can I say this? I think so. We were at this place once before, you know. And I'm not, I, I've got to be very careful because I don't want to identify someone that's staff here permanently. But somebody said, yours is a strange church. How's that? The, well, the what, last one was here. They, they got right over here. And they said... I want eight people with $1,000 down here right now. <laughs> Isn't that intelligent? Why? You know, what was he thinking about? 
I'll let you guess. $8,000, that's what he was thinking about, okay? Uh, I have, oh well, I better be quiet. Anyway, I'm not too sure that that same group isn't following us this time. <clears throat> well, too bad these old walls don't talk, huh? Whew. Of course, when you preach on national television, it gets around anyway, doesn't it? Oh well. Okay, for uh, the Balaam, that's what he did for, for money, but what about old Corey, gainsaying of Corey? Corey thought Moses had taken too much upon himself, you know, right, writing the Ten Commandments, not giving God credit, and starting this religion and just leading everyone around. He said, join my church. And he, boy, he had it now. He was... He, I forget how many thousand were with him. It's written, I think, in the book of Numbers. And God told Moses to divide his church from his, which is to say his people from his. They backed away, and God made a crevice in the earth and let the whole bunch drop in and enclosed it. God doesn't like false teaching. God doesn't like people that play church. Anyway, that's what he's talking about here, 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, remember the fig tree Jesus uh, threw the whammy on, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. In other words, they're worthless, they're dead brush. What do you do with dead, dead brush? You throw it on the burning pile. That's what that stuff is worth, so be smart enough to stay away from it. And listen, it can happen anywhere. It can happen in this group. Somebody can hand you a bunch of pages of a bunch of malarkey trying to pull you off into their little clique or something of that nature when you've got the Bible, when you've got the Word of God that'll keep you out of trouble. You would read trash? I don't think so. I hope I've taught you better than that. 13, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. Now there's your clue. Do you, know what, do you know what you were called before you were born of woman on this earth? God called him, you, my stars were happy. Beautiful. Book of Job chapter 38 declares that. To whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. So that... And unfortunately, that's true. The, the fallen angels, as well as Satan, haven't got a prayer. They're sentenced to death. Why? They left their first habitation, which is to say they came from heaven to earth to seduce woman rather than to be born of her. Listen carefully. 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Did you know about all that's written of Enoch is written in the book of Genesis and it said the Lord liked him and took him. He was too good for this earth. But he was a preacher. And he knew what was happening between these fallen angels and he preached against it and it got so filthy, so bad that God said, I'm going to just take that good man of God out of that. And he took him. So Enoch was a preacher. And he was one of the first preachers to preach against Satan, the false Messiah, the fallen angels, and so forth. And God was pleased with that. Why, was God, why did God take him? So you would know today that that pleases him. That you stand against this filth of the end times that Satan is about to propagate upon this world. Those four are going to be loosed. And four simply means what? It's earth. It simply means from the four corners of the earth, they're going to come. And we know approximately how many there are. Uh, Revelation 11 says there's 7,000 of them. But they're supernatural. So you've got to be real careful. So here we see that at the sixth trump, the sixth angel, and it doesn't mention sounding, is the one that releases them. Now let's, let's talk about how they're released. I want to go to the Old Testament. I always like to work in a little bit of both to show and prove 
that God's Word, whether it is old or new, nothing is new under the sun to our Father. And that's the way it is. Book of Isaiah, turn there with me. Go to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1, I will begin reading. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. And of course, the king of Babylon is who you're on guard against in these end times. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, that's testify. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. Three, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Who, what is his highness? His elect, the ones that he will utilize to accomplish his work here on earth as a part, that is. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. This is the sixth trump. So what it's talking about when they're loosed, when they're turned loose, they come from a far country and from the end of heaven, underline that, from the end of heaven. It didn't say from Jamaica or it didn't say Ireland or it didn't say the good old US of A. They come from heaven. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. What land? Babylon, what's Babylon? Confusion. False teachings, babble, trash, things ungodly, lasciviousness, and so forth. On and on the list goes. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. That's, at this, that's the day of vengeance we were talking about. I wanted to work this in so that you weave together the events that consummate the end of this age. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Going to be a little scary if you don't know who your father is. Be sure in being the commander-in-chief's army, that's God's, okay? Or you've got a reason to feel faint. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall gleam as Flames or gleam is the point of a weapon. What does it mean as a woman in travail? It means it's going to be like a, a lot like a woman giving birth, and it is speaking of the birth of a new age. Uh, you can ask any, women in here that are mothers, and they will tell you about how those pains come closer and closer as, as you near the birth. Well, so it is when you see this world and its corruption and pain as they come closer and closer, the prophecies fitting closer and closer until it is one eruption of time and of people and of evilness until Satan himself stands on Mount Zion as the false messiah meaning Jesus, trying to be Jesus. He'll never make it, all right? But he will in the minds of a lot of people Verse 9, listen carefully. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel. I, I would rather translate this stern. Stern both with wrath and furious anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Sinners are what? To transgress against laws, God's command is sin. It's not some little thing you might do that you fall short on. To sin is to transgress against the law of God. And these people are experts at it. Very much an expert at it. Verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and in its, his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. What this is saying at that time when Christ returns, the true Christ, the brightness, the joy, the light in as much as he is our light. And don't think so much of light from uh, candle power. Now think of love, 
brightness. It, it is, his coming is so great that you won't even notice the sun or the moon or the stars or anything else. I'll give you a good clue, even the constellations, I'll give you a good clue why you won't notice because he comes at the seventh trump and you are instantly changed out of that body into a spiritual body that is heaven in itself. No pain. Like when you stand right now in these flesh bodies, you have like um, someone like myself, you have 140 pounds between your foot bones and the bottom of your shoes. Maybe we better make it 250, all right? <laughs> Let's be honest in as much as we're dealing with God's Word. But that's a lot of pressure, you know, on muscle and bone. And it's tiring. But with that, you're totally released. You feel like turn loose, free. And that's going to happen. And it's going to be a wonderful thing within itself. And that's how you're going to be when you see him coming then because you're in that dimension. I hope I'm not going too far and maybe confusing some people because God is in a different dimension than we are. That's why you can't see him and live. You've got to be changed before you can see him. It's a different dimension. Example, Christ walked through the wall, which was really there, Christ or the wall. No, they both were, but they were in different dimensions, okay? So, um, and there's no great mystery to that. That's the difference between flesh and spiritual. But it's, it is a wonderful time, and to be able to live in a body like that, and to just feel so free from pain, pressure, sensitive to this, that, and the other, all gone. It's going to be a beautiful time, and if I'm not careful, I'm going to digress, but I like to think about that, okay? Verse 11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will, not maybe, not perhaps, I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. There's no one haughtier than Satan or his little ones. 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than a golden wedge of Ophah. That was the most pure gold there was. One more verse. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth. He's going to do what? Now, don't, don't miss that. He's not going to just shake uh, uh, Branson, Missouri. He said he's going to shake heaven. There's only one time that happens when he's ready to empty it out. And unfortunately, that's where the, the, they're chained, okay? And shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his furious anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe, so on and so forth. Okay, that's the day it happens. Our Father is unhappy. And I'm sure if we think we're anxious in the countdown, he naturally goes by his plan but he's anxious also. How are they loosed? I think it's important that here you are in the fifth trump and we're coming up to the sixth possibly. We will sometime. And we know it will be in this generation. How are they loosed? You know it by heart. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 7. Listen carefully and think on the things we've covered this week in. And there was a war in heaven. You've heard about that war already once this weekend. You read it, in, we, we discussed it in the 10th chapter of Daniel. You were given a great deal of information there. I hope you didn't overlook it. Something about 31 years. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Whoa. And the great dragon was cast out, 
the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, not heaven, into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's when they're loosed. They're loosed in a way that they're booted out, exiled, where? Right here on earth. When he comes as the false Messiah, and as Jesus would say, it's gonna be just like it was in the time of Noah. You don't have to use a stretch of an imagination. Read about Noah, you know how it was. You know what they did. They're gonna do it again, if possible, but not to you. I'll guarantee you one thing, if I see any of you sucked into that pit, as long as we've taught and everything, the two before is gonna be polished, okay? <laughs> I jest in a way, you're just not gonna let it happen because you don't find him tempting. You find him an abomination that he would do that to our people. And friend, we, we are sent here to help our people, not for ourselves, but to do God's work to see that people are dragged from the fire and saved by the Savior himself and to teach discipline even in the millennium. You're not gonna be able, you're not gonna have to teach Bible because everybody will know. You won't have to ask your neighbor, do you know the word of God? They will, that's biblical. But you will have to teach them discipline. That's, we are so, the churches have lost discipline, schools have lost discipline, and unfortunately, many families have lost discipline. And that's, what, that's the glue that holds a family together. They're cast out onto this earth. There's no great secret about that. 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Do you know there's a war going on in heaven? And he still accuses. You get out here as one of God's elect and get a little sleepy driving, you pull over and stop. You know why? When you're going home and you cross that yellow line, God, Satan's going to run and say, God, you see your elect to cross that yellow line. They're sleepy. I'm gonna have them here in my side if they're not careful. I'm jesting, be careful going home. That's what I'm saying, okay? But Satan does, he accuses God's elect every time they mess up. And that embarrasses our father. Just like it would if one of your neighbors come over and said, you know what that brat of yours did to my mailbox? You know? <laughs> Always those accusers. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. What by? Blood of the lamb, that's the only way. And by the word of our, their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Okay. So there we know how he is cast out. Michael does it. We know that Michael put up quite a struggle, Daniel, for uh, 31 years. And this is, this is spiritual and it is prophecy, okay? That's why Daniel, it was a three full weeks, but the formula is there for anyone to absorb that would fall in the fifth trunk. Interesting and more interesting. Now, we've been reading along here with the sixth trump. We've studied the sixth seal. And we've studied the sixth vial pretty good. You know, Satan comes. But you see, your time now, that's 666. What about 555? Because that's where you are. And 555 gives you the prophecy or the prophetic answer to what's happening and what God expects of you. So what we better do is back up a little bit off of the six and get back to the five and see if we can't glean a little knowledge from prophecy concerning that. And let's do it quickly right here in this book of Revelation because I'm not gonna go much further, further, 
Chapter 6 in Revelation. Chapter 6. And I want verse 9. We're going, to, we're going to look at the fifth trump, the fifth seal. Because what happens in those periods is what you're supposed to be doing now. Okay? Verse 9 of chapter 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Not for Robin Banks, for the word of God. And the testimony, underline that. This is the time of testimony which they held. It is the testimony of God's word. The fifth is a time of teaching. Now, I'm going to stress that. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? That means they were human beings because they had blood on them that dwell on the earth. And naturally they lost their lives on earth. And, you know, I can think of a lot of them. James, John, they beheaded him and so on and so forth. And there's been many others that have died for teaching the truth. The truth is not always popular. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that which that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. As they were what? What were they killed for? for testimony, for witness, for truth. And, and don't read this and think it's all, well, they're going to kill my flesh body. Satan doesn't care a whole lot about your flesh body. He wants your soul. So he wants a spiritual death, not a physical death necessarily. So you better think of that in terms of spiritual death. What is a spiritual death? It's for you to be sucked in by him. That is to say, swallow his lies. Stick with the testimony of Almighty God. Don't take this man or any other man's without checking it out many times from every angle. Now, that's kind of what we've done this weekend. We've looked at this whole situation. We found out how the loosing takes place and what it was in 555 that we're supposed to be doing. Testimony, testimony, testimony. Let's, let's go to the fifth trump now. Verse chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Now what that means is, and the, this, the fifth trump is telling you what's going to happen in the sixth. It's a time of testimony, a time of teaching. I don't know if you got that key. It's the key of David. And you can unlock all these lies of Satan and see through them and stick with truth, okay? And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as of the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Four, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now that gives you a great clue as to how you stand. Those that are loosed have orders, strict orders, probably to the death, don't touch my people. You can go down there and fool those silly wogs and polywogs all you want to. A polywog is something that hasn't grown up into maturity. That's a Christian that's still sucking bottled milk and is not potty trained, okay? You can go down there and fool all them you want to because they've listened to some revolving rev and have never cracked my letter. Sick of them. So you see, they're really doing God a favor. 
God's going to practice some very, very tough love. And it's coming very, very soon. We're going one more. You know the rest of that chapter. I don't have to read it to you. Teach your people about that chapter, the fifth trump. What's going to happen? Satan is coming for a five-month period to lead his own little army and all those he can deceive, and he's going to be very successful at it. You can rest, that assur you're rest assured. But then, after you teach that, then he gives the order in 13 of this night, loose those four demons. Now, I want to give you something in closing that's very encouraging. Turn to Revelation 16 with me. This is our last stop in this lecture. I want to reiterate, 555 is what's going on right now. Have you noticed that things in the, of the recent past, I mean, it's getting pretty bad, you know? Things are, things are really tightening up. Do you know why? It's written right here. Chapter 16, verse 10. And the fifth angel, here's your last five, 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 five. What does five mean? It's grace, of course. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Now, let me tell you something. You listen to me. Don't you read over that. This happens before Satan is cast to this earth. He's got a hot seat. He's squirming. He's being punished even in heaven right now. So he's going to throw everything he can at you because he's hurting. Praise God. <laughs> Hurt him all the more as far as I'm concerned. But this isn't after the sixth trump. This is in the fifth when you're teaching here. Remember Michael's little scrimmage we were talking about? It's underway in this fifth uh, vial. He's pouring acid right in his seat there. I, that's not literal, please. He's making him so uncomfortable, he's beginning to look for a new home. Make sure it isn't yours. Make sure that you keep abreast of God's word. You guard your family from that bunch because they're evil. And they will have you fighting each other. They will have you tearing each other apart. And it's going to get worse before it gets better because Michael knows how to get the job done. 31 years, he'll get it done. But woe to us on earth that are outside of God's plan. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Oral Murray set a date? I hope you don't think that. No, I did not set a date. But it's pretty easy, and we read and proved basically how long that war is going to last. So you use your knowledge and your wisdom. Look deep with understanding. And maybe you'll get a better light of why things are happening in this world as they are. Satan is very uncomfortable. He's in pain. And again, I have to say, every time I think about it, yes, it's wonderful, great, pour it on him. All right. <clears throat> Verse 12, and the sixth angel, here we come to his appearance here, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Well, that's a coincidence, isn't it? Well, there it is again. Huh. And the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. <clears throat> and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This is the hour of the Antichrist, of course. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day 
of God Almighty. Satan's already hurting, friend. And he's going to be coming here, but the great day of the Lord approaches soon after that, the day of vengeance. That's what this has been about this weekend. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. I know all of you are well robed because your white linen is fabricated from the, your righteous acts, that is to say, serving God, documented in the 19th chapter, 7th and 8th verse of this great book, Revelation. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Ormageddon. Arm means hill or city, town. Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? The fallen angels that he threw out on earth. Satan that takes his stand as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 on Mount Zion claiming to be God. There's no great mystery to God's word. And the timing is precious. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. i tell you something. We are far along in the process. And when you look at this world today, it doesn't take long to distinguish the fact that somebody's hurting because people are hurting. But Satan himself is very uncomfortable and that means he's not going to be still very long without striking out against God's holy people, his righteous people. So whatever you do, take these thoughts, weave them into your mind and reason, make further studies in God's word and you'll really be blessed. Keep up with the time and the dates of the events in God's plan the trumps, the vials, and the seals. And you won't be caught off guard. You will be servants of God as you are, and you will not be caught sleeping. That's really what this whole weekend is about. Don't get caught sleeping on your watch because things are happening. And I figure from that 16th chapter, that things are gonna start happening a lot sooner yet because when Satan hurts, he makes everybody hurt that will allow him. You don't have to, why? You have power over him. You're a vi winner, you're a victor. Well, if a person knew then when we, the fifth trump started and how long that fight lasts, they'd be pretty comfortable. Listen, I love you all. Dennis, I'm gonna ask you to come on out if you're back. He always is. <laughs> I love you all very much. I love you because you enjoy studying in our Father's Word. Let's get into some questions. We're gonna go with Dwayne from Canada. How would we know if we were one of the lost tribes of Israel by study. Where did they go? Well, the first 12, uh, 10 rather, were taken captive by the Assyrians. The second two were taken captive by the Babylonians and simply trace where they went. Those that were taken by the Assyrian migrated north over the Caucasus Mountains, were later called Caucasians, Celts, Celts, and migrated over Europe and many later coming to this nation. And Judah would return back to Jerusalem and don't confuse the house of Judah with the house of Israel, it's two separate houses. And by tracing your genealogy then, you know where you fit into that. It's that simple, all right? Little uh, legwork. Charles from Florida. I've been told that divorced people should uh, lead single, secluded lives, and have been doing so for 15 years. Could you tell me if this is right? 
You know, my heart would ache for you, Charles, because somebody's lied to you and you've lost 15 years, possibly, if you met someone you loved in that time. Because you see, what they're telling you is that Christ can't forgive sins. That's what he died on the cross for. You're listening to some yo-yo, ratchet jaw preacher that only knows Christ said, without repentance, if you remarry after you made the commitment before God, then you're in adultery. But adultery is not the unforgivable sin. Once you repent, he is able to wash away all sin with the exception of one, and it's certainly not divorce. So you've let some yahoo rob you of 15 years. Now, I, if I were you, I'd, be, I'd get my back up at them just a little bit because you've listened to yo-yos that have flat ripped you off, man. I'd, I would be upset about it if, it if I were you. But then, let's face it, you're the one that listened to them, so you have to suffer with it too. But no, you praise God and you repent of any part of sin you might have because certainly none of us are perfect and it takes two to tangle to cause a divorce. You repent and shuck it down. And if the Lord should send you a beautiful mate, a wonderful person, Hey, why waste time? If I did not believe that Christ could forgive sin, I would stop preaching, teaching today. But I know that he forgives sin and gives you a fresh new start, a new creature. Once you repent of that sin, you are a new creature, not a divorcee. Anytime somebody tries to put you in shackles or bondage for being a Christian, rip them out of your life. Don't let them do that to you. It's a disgrace to Christianity, people that teach such trot as that. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.